We're so glad you're all with us today. I want to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, and here's what the Scripture says. Paul writing, he says, When you forgive this man, I forgive him too. And when I forgive whatever needs to be forgiven, I do so with Christ's authority for your benefit, so that Satan will not outsmart us. I've highlighted this part for a reason. It says, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. Paul forgave somebody that whoever he was writing to also forgave, and he was just trying to close the door because he knew what Satan was like. The devil has a plan for your life. We are not to be scared of him. We're not to be obsessed by him. He's not that big a deal. But at the same time, even though he's a defeated foe, he does have evil schemes. And Paul's referencing the fact that he was closing the loop on a gap that may have existed, and he throws this line out, but it's a good landing point for what I want to share today. Um, some sports, some teams have uh, coaches that they employ specifically to study the opposition. It's like they've got a staff, but one of the staff's sole job is to see who they're playing next week and study their schemes, study their strategies, and that's their job. I feel like today I, I'm the opposite, that, that coach that wants to study the opposition. We, we don't normally study the opposition. We're not, we're not impressed by the opposition, but what we are, you know, while it's foolish to be totally obsessed by the devil, it's just as foolish to pretend he doesn't exist. And, and there is a real enemy that we've got to deal with, and that's why I've provocatively called today's message, If I Was the Devil. First thing I need you to know is that I'm not. <laughs> you can write that down. People could soundbite this message and it could be dangerous. The pastor wore black. I knew this church was dodgy. He called himself the devil. If I was the devil. You know, anyone like eating magnum ice creams? So you'd be familiar with the seven deadly sins. They went through a marketing campaign where they advertised Magnum, seven flavors, but they call each flavor a sin, a deadly sin, like lust, greed, hate, envy, pride, sloth, wrath. I mean, I felt guilty eating it normally without the label. Now you feel like you're eating. It's just, it was horrible. But, you know, if I were the devil, I, you know, those seven, uh, you know, they, they, they'll mess your life up. You know, they, if, if, if I were the devil, I'll get you to mess up on the big ten. You know, ten commandments are pretty obvious. Do not murder. If some of you, if you need to write that down, go ahead, write it down. Don't kill my neighbor. You know, don't steal. Don't commit adultery. It's probably not good for your marriage. You know, don't, don't do the obvious things. You know, even in Proverbs, uh, G, uh, the scripture talks about seven things that the Lord hates, seven abominations. Let me re read them out to you quickly. Uh, haughty eyes. Haughty eyes. Just be careful that your makeup does not make your eyes look haughty. Uh, lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. These are seven things God says he hates. A heart that devises wicked schemes. Feet that are swift in running to evil. False witness who utters lies. And one who spreads strife among brothers. Gossip. God says, I hate these things. I, I, don't, I, don't, a lot of, I don't just dislike them, I hate them. So if I were the devil, and I'm not, but if I were, I would try to get you with the big seven or the big ten or the seven things that the Lord hates because, you know, people think Christianity is about what you do and what you don't do, but it's not really. It's about things that God sets up that lead to life and things that the enemy sets up that lead to death. And obviously, he'd want to take you down the path, whatever city, culture, country you come from, down that which leads to death. But the devil isn't always going to turn up with his pitchfork, his red cape, his horns, because if he turned up that way, most of us are going to go, uh oh, stay away. You know, the temptation of Christ, which no doubt most of you have read at some point in the Gospels, where Jesus, fully God but now restrained, confined himself as fully man, went into the desert led by the Spirit of God for 40 days to fast. And the devil turns up, but my contention, my theory is, is that he didn't turn up looking with his pitchfork, his horns, and his red cape. Because often the devil can come dressed as an angel of light. And he might have turned up, an angel might have turned up on day 40, and Jesus is there. And you think about the three temptations. He says, you know, just turn these stones into bread. You fasted long enough, and Jesus might have been looking at that angel, this bright angel going, something doesn't sound right. 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then, and then, he, and then the angel tries something else. You know, um, why don't you step out of the boat? Jump off the mountain. Angel, so he starts quoting Psalm 91. You know, you will not dash your foot against a stone. The, the Lord will catch. Oh, no, something doesn't sound right. This angel sounds cool, looks cool. Oh, no, you shall not test the Lord your God. Don't put him to the test. Anyone ever watch Avengers? You've seen Loki? Okay, Loki. There's like the devil. It's like he, he comes disguised as something else. If you haven't watched the Avengers, don't worry about it. It's just the idea that he can come in disguise. And then the third one. Loki blows his cover. I'm this stupid devil. I mean, really? He got frustrated that Jesus didn't fall for the first two So He says, listen, I'll give you everything. Just worship me. That's all I'm asking for. Ah, oh, you're the devil. Get out. And Jesus says, away from me, Satan. Why did Jesus say away from me, Satan, after the third one? I mean, surely, what, was Jesus really entertaining a devil for the first two rounds? The, the devil often doesn't come in, in, in the red horns. He will come as a dress up. My theory, it doesn't really matter, but I think the devil turned up as an angel. And only when he revealed himself with the real motive of wanting worship, did the man Christ Jesus go, you are the devil, get out. So the devil is not going to come with just the big seven, the big ten. I mean, he will. But most of us, just off the back of conference, just off the back of revival, just off the back of what God's doing, you know, we're probably not going to kill someone this week. We're probably not going to do anything contentiously horrible this week. So if I were the devil, I'd have to come a little bit more subtly. And here are some of the schemes. Paul recognized one. He said, I'm closing the loop on that unforgiveness one. And here's a couple of things that I'd do. First strategy, if I were the devil. You know, it's, you know when, you're the oppos- when you're the coach studying the opposition, you have to think like the opposition. This is a one-off sermon. We are not doing a series on if I were the devil. People will start accusing us of stuff. But, but, but just for a second, think about it. Because often we think it's just life. It's just coincidence. It's just people. And if I were the devil, that's what I want. I want you to think it's anything but him. He's got a strategy. He's got a scheme. And we won't let him win today. First thing I'd do is I'd get you to isolate yourself. If I were the devil. I'd get you to isolate yourself. It's hardly murder. It's hardly hate. Hardly wrath, but I'd get you to isolate yourself. Genesis 2, chapter 18, chapter 2, verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good. Not good, not good, bad. Everyone say not good. It is not good that man should be alone. There was no sin yet in the world at this point. No serpent had tempted, no woman who hadn't existed. Before sin, God found something that was not good. Before sin. People are like, well, is this me and God? Well, there was just Adam and God, and God said it's not good. A number of people are like, I don't need church, I don't need people, it's just me and God. Well, there was Adam and God. In fact, no devil, no sin. God says it's not good. So if I were the devil, I would get you to think just you by yourself is fine. And yet, the Bible is clear that the enemy when we are alone, has the privilege and the opportunity to do whatever he can to get you. And in 1 Peter 5, 8, he says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the opposition, the devil, he walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He can't devour everybody. If you watch National Geographic, I like watching YouTube, I like watching, I don't know what it is, but you, the lion sits there. He, he can dominate almost any animal, but he can't beat a herd. And so what he does is he, the enemy is seeking whom he can devour. So if I were the devil, and I can't get you to do one of the big seven, the big ten, or the big seven, I would get you to go, you know what? You don't really belong here. You should be offended. Nobody understands you. See, they didn't look at you. Pastor didn't acknowledge you. You know, da-da. and it just gets you isolated. Because that's who the devil can devour. God saw Adam by himself, said it's not good. I had not sinned, I had not done anything big, God says not good. Now this is not necessarily uh, an invitation for every single person straight after this message to go out, find a wife, and get married. Although if you need a scripture for that purpose, you now have one, you're welcome. I know married people who are very isolated, and I know single people who've got great community. So it's not good that we're alone. 
And if I were the devil, I'd do whatever I can to get you to the point where you feel introspective, internal, just misunderstood, hurt, nobody gets you, you don't fit in, you don't dress like them, you don't look like them, you don't talk like them, and do whatever he can because people have swallowed the lie. It's not murder, it's not greed, it's not hate, but nobody gets me. So I, and I just get you to isolate yourself. And by the way, real connection isn't just online. We do online. Right now we're online. Everything is, online's good. That's the world we live in. But online is an addition. It's not a substitution. Do you know, if virtual connection, if online connection was all that God intended, Jesus would have FaceTimed in from heaven. Hey, everyone, it's me. <laughs> Check out the pearly gates. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. And he would have died a virtual death on a virtual cross online, but he didn't. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and he came where we were. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Why? Because real connection is vital, and I'm speaking to the choir because you're all in church this morning, but I want to encourage you. Do you know you can be disconnected in a connect? Because connection isn't proximity, it's vulnerability. You're only as connected as you're vulnerable. You go to someone to work your whole life for 50 years and not be close to them because real connection is your vulnerability. To the degree that you're vulnerable with someone is the depth of your connection. You want to know how close you are to some person in your life? Check your vulnerability because to the degree you open up. So let's make sure we are a vulnerable people that stay connected because if I were the devil, I would do whatever I could to get people isolated. Jesus even in Gethsemane. He took his friends. Now, admittedly, they weren't much help on Global Prayer Night because they all fell asleep. But he still took people. If I can't get you to get the big seven, the big ten, or the big seven, I'd get you to feel so uniquely different. Whether it's through offense, whether it's through fear, whether it's through misunderstanding. So that, well, you know what? You didn't go to conference. You don't really fit in anymore. Look at what they're talking about. Blah, 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 blah. Don't, don't buy any of those lies. No matter who you are, where you're from, you belong. And God wants you as part of a community and a family. Because on your own, if I were the devil, if I can get you by yourself, I've got you as good as dead. Because, you know, people are like, I'll never do those big sins. Do you know, when he's get you, you know, most people who sin badly, it's when they're isolated. They feel down. They feel excluded, and that's when they do silly things. In a herd, you're not likely to kill someone in the connect group. <laughs> not likely to mess around too bad when you're around godly people. Here's the real question. Are there godly people in your life? I know there are godly people sitting around you right now, but are there godly connections? Are there vulnerable conversations you have with godly people? Strengthen godly connections and it will help. If I were the devil, the second thing you'd do, I'd get you to blame others. I'd get you to blame others. There's a condition going around the world right now. It's called blamatitis. Blamatitis It's not really a condition. Don't fact check me. It's not true. I just made it up. But you know what? The world is making up conditions anyway these days. So let's just add another one to the mix. Let's call it blamatitis. Blamatitis is simply the condition where it's always someone else's fault. It's my parents' fault, my boss's fault, my neighbor's fault, my pastor's fault, the prime minister's fault, the last prime minister's fault, the next prime minister's fault. It's, my, it's somebody's fault. It's always someone's fault except mine. And what blamatitis does, if I were the devil, I would want a dose of blamatitis to spread through the body of Christ because it would mean that you never really deal with what's really the issue. And even though everyone may contribute to the, the polluted nature and nurture of your situation, blamatitis ensures you never take responsibility for the part you can fix, which is you. A man went to the doctor once and um, he said, doctor, you got to help me. I'm really in a lot of pain, a lot of trouble. Every organ is really hurting me. He goes, what do you mean? Explain. He says, well, when I touch my left shoulder, it hurts. When I touch my side, it hurts. When I touch my right knee, it hurts. When I touch my head, it hurts. When I touch my toe, it hurts. And the doctor goes, I've worked out what you've got. And he goes, what is it? You've got a broken finger. Your finger's broken. <laughs> if everywhere you touch hurts, who's really broken? I've met pastors where every person in their church is a problem. Well, who's the problem? I've met people where every pastor they've met is the problem. Who's the problem? Is this too heavy? Listen, studying the opposition is not to get scared of them so we can beat them. So we can beat them. 
And if I were the devil and I can't get you with the big seven or the big ten, I'd get you with isolation or I'd get you with blamatitis. Blamatitis simply means, you know, and again, we don't have to look further than the first man ever created for evidence of blamatitis. Adam! Before sin was guilty of isolation, not really his fault, God only made one. But this one was definitely his fault. The woman you gave me, she made me eat the fruit. Stop blaming your wife and all the wives said, that was your one chance. The woman you gave me. No, Adam, you put the fruit in your mouth yourself. (laughs) Blame a Titus. It's a surefire way to keep your finger broken. Matthew 7, 3 to 5. Why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of the speck in your eye When you can't see past the log in your own eye, hypocrite, Jesus, swear it's not mine. First, get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Do you know, if you had a tube of toothpaste and you squeezed it, what would come out? Toothpaste. Why? It was always on the inside. When you and I get squeezed, what's coming out was what was always on the inside. You can blame the hand that squeezed you. Oh, I can't believe what you made me do. Look how angry you make me. Look how jealous you make me. Look how insecure you make me. Yeah, but it was always inside. So what we do is we blame the hand that squeezes us, but it was always inside. Can I tell you, if the tube of toothpaste is empty and you squeeze all you want, nothing is coming out. If you are empty of anger, if you're empty of hurt, if you're empty of insecurity, if you're empty of lust, no matter what squeezes you, nothing's coming out. What comes out was always what was on the inside. And rather than pointing the finger at everything else that's hurting, I want to encourage us. Let's own it. Let's take responsibility. We will only grow. And if I were the devil, I would. And I can't get you to do the big ones. I'd go for isolation and I'd go for blamatitis. You know, when a a goldsmith is refining fire and he turns the heat up and the liquid gold starts bubbling up, what happens uh, is the impurities rise to the surface. And the the process is he gets some sort of ladle or some sort of scoop and gets rid of the impurities because the fire brings the toothpaste out. The fire brings the stuff out. The real challenge, and this is where blamatitis kicks in, we have a choice when the impurities rise to the surface what to do with it. Most of us, if we're not careful, if I were the devil, would go, just pray to God to take the fire off. Turn the fire out. And what would happen is, if that's all they did, a blamatitis goes, I can't believe how hot you made this thing. I can't believe what I have to go through. Those same impurities would settle right back into the gold. And the whole idea of the fire is to bring the impurities to the top. And when we own it, when we acknowledge it, God clears it, God cleanses it. And what's left is a purer version of what was already there. But if I were the devil and I can get blame and titus through the body, you will never allow those things because it's always someone else's fault. Rather than going, I own it, God. Look at these impurities that have come to the surface. They're coming out of me, God. Challenge me, change me, do whatever you got to do. I own it. I repent from it. Please remember move it. Taking responsibility. See, I, I know that there's all of us have challenges, but here's the question. Do you leave the service just more convinced about who else needed to hear the sermon? Or do you go, man, I, I got stuff. I got to deal with it. You know, Jesus on the cross, he didn't blame, I, he didn't blame them. He forgave them. Can't believe you guys are nailing me. He, he, there's something about blamatitis that will keep you stagnant, it'll keep you fruitless, it'll keep your finger broken, and you'll be mad. You'll be x-raying every organ. Find out what they're going on. Hire an investigator for them. Check out what they're doing. Let's go to uh, just God created me a clean heart. Search me, oh God, and know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's not be ever a group of people that is guilty of blamatitis. And the church said... If I were the devil, the third thing I'd do is I'd get you to separate the spiritual. Separate the spiritual. What does that mean? Well, you, can, you know, if I'm the devil and I can't stop you from going to church, I'll confine you to staying in the church or just being limited. Keep your God thing to Sunday. Don't bring it into Monday. Keep your God thing in the service. Keep your God thing... You know, I, I, Christians in the worship auditorium and heathens in the foyer. I, I've met people who, believe it or not, I'd meet him in the foyer of something. No, 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 not this location, not your location, some other location I'm thinking about, not, not, we're not here. And literally, 
they just sat there and they go, Pastor, great message, great sermon today. And then they will go and just violate the very thing that message talked about. I'm like, what, what happened? But you know why? Because we can get good at separating the spiritual, confining it. That's fine for that group, fine for that. And what we do is we compartmentalize our life in the name of organization. That's my church life. That's my home life. That's my work life. That's my friend's life. That's my boy's night out life. Don't touch that compartment. That's my hobby. That's my hobby. That's my friends. That's my fears. That's my hopes. That's my dreams. And we've got all the chests of drawers well organized. It's called compartmentalization. The problem with compartmentalization is God is in one compartment. And you just stay out of the rest of my life, lest you come collide all these areas and I really don't know which way to turn. And the problem is, it is actually a strategy of the enemy. Samson's like, God, I can kill any enemy you want me to. Leave my Delilah box to myself. I can handle her. Don't worry, God, I got her. You know, the, the life is filled with people who think they can handle all these different areas and really... If we're not careful, it could be the strategy of the enemy to separate the spiritual from the secular, the spiritual from what you normally do. One of the areas often he does is he separates your spirituality from your job. Because your job isn't in the church. It's you're your nurse, you're a doctor, you're a teacher, you're a lawyer, you're an IT person, you're retired, you're raising kids, you're, you're starting your own business, you're designing something, you're cooking something, you're making something, you're building something, you're demolishing something. Whatever you're doing, whatever your job is, and he can get you to separate that. He can isolate the secular from the sacred. And yet that's not how God intended it. God says everything in your gift mix is worship unto him when it's done unto him. You are not just Christian on Sunday. You're not just Christian in church. You're not just Christian in the service. You are Christian every day of the week. Colossians 3 says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord, rather than for the bank, rather than for the, the organization, rather than for the school, rather than for the hospital, rather than for your boss, remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is, is Christ. That's your boss. That's your boss. Include him in everything. Include him consciously. You know, when I was a lawyer, I'd be like, Jesus, I don't know how to do this clause. Please help me. And I didn't see angels, but I just learned to include God in everything. Don't confine God to just the auditorium. Don't confine God to just the service. Don't confine God to just one area. Include him in, even in your work. You know, religion separates, but relationship overlaps. Jemima's in another space, another country, another city, another campus. It really doesn't matter. She's still my wife. I mean, like, it's not like Tuesday night's date night. Then we're husband and wife. People who have affairs have compartmentalized. Again, a little bit too full on for church, but let's just talk about life. I mean, it's real. The enemy, if I were the devil and I can't get you to stop going to church, I'll get you to draw a circle around church. You didn't come to church. You are the church. The church met in a building. And then the church got to go and have lunch and the church got to go to bed and the church got to wake up the next day and the church got to go to work. Don't separate the spiritual. Don't separate. Converge the whole thing. Converge the whole thing. You know, the other thing he tends to do is he tends to separate the spiritual from relationships. So in other words, I've met people like me and God is good. Me and people, separate issue. And God has something really strong to say about people who want to separate their spirituality when it comes to how they treat people and how they treat God. In fact, you can't say you, I love you, God, but please keep people away from me. So, you know, if you want total freedom, be single and don't hang around people. I have all the gifts of the Spirit when I'm alone with God. It's when I run into human beings that we realize I was deceived and I actually am missing a bunch of them. Because it's interaction with humans. It's my relationships with people. And so what we do when we, if I were the devil, I'll get you to separate the spiritual and say, you, you and God are fine. You can hate them. That's why Paul was closing the loop. In the scripture we read, he said, I forgive that person too. Are you forgiving them? Because I don't want a gap between me and you. Here's what 1 John 4 says. Listen to this. If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother or sister, this is the phrase that really gets me, thinking nothing of it. How can you think nothing of it? How can I love God? Hate you and think nothing of it. It's because I've become really good at separating the spiritual. It should bother me if I hate people. 
but I want to love God. He's a liar. If he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God he can't see? The command we have from Christ is blunt. I love this phrase. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love them both. In other words, no separation allowed. You cannot separate the spiritual and go, well, that's just fine. That's just how I am with God, and it's just people that bother me. It's not possible. God says you can't do that. You cannot separate the two. God has this divine propensity to, to, to connect everything you say you want to do for him with humans. It is, a, it is semi-annoying to the flesh. God, I love you. Love them. No. I said, I love you. Have you met them? No. I honor you, God. Good. Honor your parents. No. I said, I honor you. Lord, I want to serve you. Good. Serve your leaders. No. I said, I want to serve you. Lord, 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 please forgive me. Yeah, once you forgive her. What? Can, can you... Can, can you allow me to, us to have our time? God says, yeah, our time is how you handle everyone else's time. See, if I were the devil and I can't get you to deny God, I'd get you to isolate God. You know, it was one of my problems when it came to church, when it, growing up, when it came to giving. Pastor gets up and goes, we're going to give to God. I don't see God. And where's the divine altar where heaven comes and sucks all the money up? Why don't you just say give to the church? I can handle that. This is my, I was a lawyer, I was analytical, I asked a thousand questions. What's really going on? Why do they have to use God? You know, then I actually started reading my Bible. It's amazing how misguided spiritual opinions can be. The strongest opinions often don't read the Bible. It's quite sad, really. Uh, when you actually read the Bible, and God says, no, when you did it, I was right through the scripture. When you gave it unto the priest, you gave it to me. When you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. Right through the scripture. God takes personally how we handle each other. And so if I were the devil, and I can't get you to hate God, I'd get you to confine him. Draw a circle around it and keep that separate. And finally, if I were the devil, I would get you, this is just four strategies today, get you to magnify the temporary. I'll get you to magnify the temporary. The scripture says, magnify the Lord with me, but if I were the devil, I'd get you to magnify the temporary. Here's what Ecclesiastes 3 says, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart, but even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. Here's what that scripture means. God took this piece of eternity and and planted it in every human, male, female, whatever ethnicity, whatever background. Even the non-Christian has a piece of eternity planted in them because he's put it in every human heart, not every Christian heart. But it's only when that piece is awoken that people start searching. But what, 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 what the, the, the real challenge is, if I were the devil, I'd get that piece of eternity and get you to ignore it. I'd put it on the shelf. I'd keep it down there. But like Iron Man, you've got to take that little thing and put it right bang smack in the middle and make eternity the filter through which you make every decision, the eternity the filter through which you decide your priorities. And I can promise you that God has a plan for every person today here under the sound of my voice. But what the devil would try to do is just diminish that piece of eternity and magnify the temporary. The, the temporary can become a drug. And we could be so just inhaling the temporary. And then every now and then a loved one dies. And we stand around a coffin and well-meaning people go, well, life is so short. Man, life is so short. Life is so short. And then the next day we're back to work. And of course, the next day you've got to go back to work. But we start inhaling the temporary. And if I were the devil, I'd get us to magnify the temporary. Where before you know it, you're 40, you're 50, you're 60, you're 70, you're 80. Where has life God. And you know, the, the, why the devil would get us to magnify the temporary is the temporary is real. The challenge is real. The pain is real. The problems are real. The people are real. But to magnify something is to make it bigger than it really is. And that's what the devil wants to do. 
He wants to make it bigger than it really is. And yet we're called to magnify the Lord. We're called to magnify God. We've got access to eternity. And if I were the devil, I'd just get you to magnify the temporary. And here's what he does. If he can get you to magnify the temporary, he'll keep you stagnant. He'll keep you fruitless. There will be no growth or increase in your life. And you won't know why. But what he's done is he doesn't mind you uh, uh, by yourself. He doesn't mind you when you're blaming others. He doesn't mind you when you've got the spiritual stuff confined. Just don't bring it into every other area of my life. And he doesn't mind when he keeps making the small stuff the big stuff. And we leave with the small stuff feeling big. And we wonder why there's no fruit. Mark chapter 8. Let me show you last verse. The seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word. That's everybody here today. That's everybody in Cambodia, Singapore, Indonesia, Dubai, London, Botswana, wherever you're at. It's everybody here. It's everybody online. It's everybody listening. He who hears the word, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life. Everyone say, this life. life. Say it with a smile because you're all looking a bit sad. Say it with this, this life. This life. You mean God's word could be crowded out by the worries of this life? Well, it is this life that I'm living, yeah, but he'd magnify it to the point where the eternal word of God has no effect. The worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things, listen, here's the tragedy, so that no fruit is produced. Oh, man. I don't want to live the kind of life where no fruit is produced. I want to make sure that every word that God plants into my heart, including the one today, bears fruit, 30, 60, and 100 fold. And the church said, you know, this, this, you know, when you, when you're the opposition, when you're the coach studying the opposition, you can end up more scared of him by the end of the service. Oh my God, the devil's horrible. See, the, the four points today aren't lust, greed, hate, and murder. It's so subtle. Because, you know, these four points we don't attribute to the devil. We attribute to people. Isolation, compartmentalization, blaming others. You know, it doesn't sound like the devil, but the devil comes in disguise. And he's got a scheme. And if he can get you with the big seven and the big ten, he'll try. But if I were the devil, I know you people love God a bit too much. You people take God seriously enough that you turn up to church. So what I'd do is I'd try something a bit more subtle. And maybe all God wants to do today is press the reset button. You know, because I'm not technologically savvy, one of the things I do when my phone gets slow, when my computer gets slow, ready? Free. This is free advice. I just turn it off. Right off. I pull the plug out. Then I put the plug in. In fact, this is my how technologically unsavvy I am. I just wait for 10 seconds just in case weird stuff's going on. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000. Then I plug it in. It's amazing. Most of the time it works again. You know, in case you didn't realize that, you, 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 I'm telling you, because you're probably going to ring some helpline and speak to an Indian anyway. <laughs> After waiting 25 minutes, 30 minutes, you explain the nuances of your complex situation. Just turn it off and put it back in and turn it on. Have you tried that, sir? Oh, great idea. That's for free. (laughs) And you know, sometimes God just wants to press the reset. And maybe the enemy is really frustrated because he got you so close to isolation. You were one decision away from total isolation. I don't need anybody, me and God. You're like, oh, Adam had God and God said it's not good. Adam didn't even have sin. Maybe he had you one, maybe maybe if if, if I did an audit of all my words, you'd find over a week So many of my words are blaming others. My thoughts are always reasoning my situation to everyone else's fault. Maybe he's got you in the rhythm where you don't even realize that you've compartmentalized your faith. And you don't mind this part, but it's the part after that he's got you kept away. And he's so close to winning the game. Or maybe he's just magnified the temporary, but today we're not going to let him win.